And now, the battle you've all been waiting for, for the undisputed most prestigious arbitrary fiction category heavyweight championship of the world. In the red corner, the reigning champion with an undefeated record of 31 wins, zero losses with 25 wins coming by way of snooty condescension, the tweed jacketed terror, the preening paragon of profundity, the Ali of alliterative aggression, literature. And in the blue corner, the challenger with a record of 23 wins, zero losses, with all 23 wins coming by way of juvenile wish fulfillment, the airport fiction assassin, the salacious sex scene superstar, the Tyson of turgid tawdriness, gone Two arbitrary categories of fiction enter. One arbitrary category of fiction leaves. Who will be victorious? And, having built up this conflict so much, how could I possibly resolve it in anything but an unsatisfying way? Stay tuned to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to analyze. Part 1. I resolved the conflict in an unsatisfying way. If you're like me, and you like spaceships and laser guns and stuff, you've probably learned to be a little self-conscious about it. After all, spaceship and laser gun based fiction is rarely met with the same kind of mainstream critical acceptance as real literary fiction. You know the kind I'm talking about. The kind you see in the syllabi for university courses. The kind you find in the literature section of a bookstore, or maybe the classics section. The type of books that important people with degrees talk about in university classrooms. In the publishing business, works like these are often lumped under the catch-all category of literary fiction, a category that basically means not genre. That is to say, no dragons, no elves, no heaving bosoms or shirtless men on the cover, none of that stuff. This division is often assumed to be based on quality, but in practice it's an artifact of two things, outdated categories and scholarly consensus lag time. Outdated Categories the truth is that many of the works we now consider to be literature were in fact genre works all along. They just fall into categories that most people no longer recognize. If you're trying to stock a bookstore or teach an English class, this is a problem. The average customer or student knows what a mystery novel is, or a romance, but do they know what a Robinsonade is, or a picaresque? Probably not. When it was first written, Tom Jones was considered a lowbrow genre work. But if you were to look for it in the bookstore today, you'd almost certainly find it in the literature section, despite the fact that the book itself is like two-thirds sex jokes, and the other third is fart jokes. Let's compare one of today's genres with one of yesterday's. The modern fantasy genre is characterized by elements shared across many of its works. Usually an ordinary person is swept up into a heroic journey, there's often a prophecy involved, and there may be dragons or monsters to fight. By contrast, a possible equivalent from antiquity is the epic poem. Nowadays, epic is a word used to describe anything big or cool, but to someone with a background in literature, the word epic denotes a specific set of tropes and genre conventions. Things like the invocation of the muses, starting in medias res, use of the epic simile, or having Zeus turn into a swan or something and knock up some poor dude's wife. So if they're both genre works, why is it that the Iliad and the Odyssey are taught in schools, and fantasy novels generally aren't? It's partly because a lot of fantasy novels are crap, but it's mostly because of... Scholarly consensus lag time. Universities are organized institutions of learning. They teach from a curriculum. The curriculum comes from scholarly consensus. Scholarly consensus is formed when professors argue and argue, and then write essays, and then argue about the essays on and on endlessly until they finally find something that most of them agree on. Like, Jane Austen was a decent author, or Anna Karenina was an okay book, I guess. As you might imagine, this is a very slow process. In fact, Jane Austen's novels didn't become a focus of academic study until more than a century after her death. Also consider the fact that there was way less crap to sort through back then. In Austen's time, there were likely fewer than 30 million English-speaking people in the entire world, and most of them didn't know how to read or write. Now there are over 300 million, the literacy rate is much higher, and the barriers to publishing are much lower. As a result of this, the volume of fiction produced in English alone every day on this planet is staggering. There is no way that the same academic establishment that took a hundred years to figure out that Jane Austen was good is ever going to be able to process all of this in our lifetimes. 
The validation and legitimacy we crave only ever comes in fits and starts, but it does eventually come. Kurt Vonnegut was once the sore-headed occupant of the drawer labeled science fiction, but he eventually won mostly mainstream critical acceptance. The same has also gradually become true of Asimov and Tolkien. The literary circle of life is happening right before our eyes. Very slowly. Part 2. What is the point of literature, then? If the legitimacy that comes with academic recognition is half hustle and half mirage, why even bother? Here's why. The clarity that comes with generations of hindsight is a useful tool. If a storytelling trick has been around for thousands of years, it must be doing something right. What's more, some conventions are so widespread and enduring that they serve as narrative shorthand. An understanding of literature gives us the chance to dust off old tropes and use them in a new way. Here come two examples, one from back in the day and one from right now. The back in the day example, Homer and Milton. Let's talk about Homer. No, not that one. This one. Homer is an ancient Greek poet of such towering reputation that even deep-browed Keats referred to him as deep-browed Homer. He's credited with composing the Odyssey and the Iliad, a pair of fanfic epics inspired by the Sean Bean and Brad Pitt characters in that movie they made about the Trojan War a while back. Or maybe the movie was inspired by the poems, I don't remember. Either way, they were epics, and they followed epic conventions. Remember this list? The first item on it is the Invocation of the Muses. In Greek mythology, the Muses were the divine beings that were in charge of creativity and inspiration and stuff. If you were about to recite a poem about heroic deeds, you wanted the Muses on your side, which is why both the Iliad and the Odyssey begin by asking them for help. Now, fast forward more than 2,000 years to Milton. No, not that one. This one. John Milton wanted to write an epic poem about Satan's fall from heaven and his later temptation of Adam and Eve. He wanted to follow the epic conventions that Homer created, but Milton was a Christian, writing a story whose subject matter came from the Bible and Catholic lore. He didn't want to invoke the pagan muses for inspiration, so instead he invoked the nearest Christian equivalent, the Holy Spirit. By doing so, he updated an ancient Greek tradition for Euston period in England, and through that tradition wrote the first part of his masterpiece, Paradise Lost. Could similar traditions be updated for use in modern genres? Yes, they could, and here's an example. The right now example, Mass Effect. If you're watching this, you've probably already played the Mass Effect series. If not, beware of spoilers ahead. Two of its character concepts use updated versions of ancient tropes ending in C, tragic and elegiac. Morden is a tragic hero. In the context of drama, tragic doesn't just mean sad. It means a specific kind of sad first described by Aristotle, and used in countless stories since from ancient Greece through Shakespeare and all the way up to today. A tragic hero is one who has a tragic flaw that has caused him or her to make a crucial mistake. Did Morden ever make a crucial mistake? Let's ask him. I made a mistake! I made a mistake. Focused on big picture. Big picture made of little pictures. Too many variables. Can't hide behind statistics. Can't ignore new data. My responsibility. Need to go. Running out of time. In the logic of classical drama, Morden is fated to die. He lost his moral perspective at a crucial moment and was complicit in the near extinction of an entire species. That species was the Krogan, which brings us to Rex, the elegiac hero. Elegiac is a word that means elegy-ish. An elegy is a type of funeral song. A story in an elegiac mood often tells of events in a golden age long past, where the death of the hero or heroes is inevitable. This mood is common in Germanic and Norse mythology, or in Old English epics like Beowulf. And it's found in the fate of the Krogan. We met in the hollows, in the graves of our ancestors. The skulls of our dead laid bare to remind us where we come from, and where we all go. The genophage ensures that their birth rate is low, while their warlike nature ensures that their death rate is high. For all their past glories, the Krogan are now on the road to extinction. The use of the elegiac mood gives their story a melancholy that adds to its emotional impact. Do Morden and Rex embody these traditions exactly? No. Nothing in fiction is ever exactly like anything else, and that's a good thing. In this case, what dooms both Morden and the Krogan is not cruel fate, as it would be in classical drama, but a man-made catastrophe 
or in this case, a Salarian made one, the Genophage. This change helps the story reflect the sensibilities of a modern audience. Fiction is a product of culture, and culture is a product of circumstance. Our circumstances now are not the same as they were in classical times, so neither is our culture, and neither is our fiction. But despite all of these changes, the audience will still recognize familiar literary traditions. Even if we don't recognize them consciously by name, we recognize them subconsciously by form. They're part of our shared cultural inheritance, the thread that links us to the past and also guides us into the future. As for genre and literature, we'll call it a draw for now. I know, I was rooting for genre too, but the real winner here is the fans, am I right? All right, all right, geez, take it easy. Next up, I try and figure out why I liked Morrowind and Skyrim so much, but just wasn't that into Oblivion. This one might take longer than usual because it's going to be hard. I also want to try making longer videos that go into more depth but take a bit longer to produce. So it'll probably be two weeks or more before you see another one. Until then, stay tuned.